Greetings all, this is Pastor Rory from Jakarta, and I'm going to give my own little evaluation and my own little critique about what's wrong with the charismatic church of today. Now, when I use that term charismatic church, I'm using it broadly, including Pentecostal, including whatever different denomination or movement comes under that type of category or classification. But before I get into what's wrong with the charismatic church, I first want to start out by stating what's not wrong with the charismatic church, because I find that often the so-called discernment ministries that you find out there, the people that are critiquing people like Benny Hinn are critiquing uh, Bill Johnson, critiquing NAR, etc., they get it so wrong. They get it wrong. They did. They 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 need to be critiqued. These different um, ministries or movements. They definitely have serious problems. But I find that those people are so blinded by their own philosophical or uh, theological biases that they don't even get the issues right, and they accuse the people of the wrong things. So I mean, they're wrong, but not wrong about oftentimes about the things that are they're being accused of by some of these so-called discernment ministries. So first of all, what's not wrong? with the charismatic church. Number one, the charismatic church is word of faith. That's not true. That's not what's wrong with the charismatic church. The charismatic church is very broad. The charismatic church encompasses assemblies of God, four square, Calvary Chapel, and many other denominations and movements that come under a very broad banner that considers itself charismatic or Pentecostal or something of that nature. They're not word of faith. Word of faith is a small, portion of this whole group made up of the followers of people, Kenneth Hagin, Copeland, and people that flow in that sort of a prosperity gospel type of movement. And that has had an influence, no doubt. But by and large, most people that come from charismatic churches are not word of faith. It's so ridiculous to see people throw out this term, word of faith, word of faith, word of faith. It's like, Word of faith is only, it's a, it's a very small percentage. It's a very small movement. And maybe it has a big presence on television because those guys are moving money, I guess. But by and large, around the world, charismatic churches are not word of faith. Now, you could say that they have been influenced to some degree by the doctrine, but they do not wear the label word of faith and for the most part do not even know what word of faith is. So the problem with charismatic churches today is not Word of faith. That is a misnomer. That is a false accusation, we could say. It's it's a false label. Number two, the charismatic churches are NAR or NAR, New Apostolic Reformation. That too is utterly absurd. It's not true. Now, there is a su such a movement. There is a such a thing as the NAR, the, the New Apostolic Reformation. People, Bill Johnson and all those sort of crowds, the prophets and all that sort of thing. A lot of them are coming down recently, but anyway, that's another matter. But but by and large, most charismatic Pentecostal churches of that sort of a persuasion, they're not in that thing. They're not under that movement. Again, you could say they've been influenced. I won't deny there is that influence there. But it's one thing to have some smattering, some degree of an influence from this smaller movement that's taking place on the fringes of a larger group. It's another thing to say, they're all in AR. They're all New Apostolic Reformation. It's absurd. It's ridiculous. Guys, get it right. You got to stop throwing those terms out there. If you want to critique the Charismatics, if you want to critique the Pentecostals, critique them on the things they're actually wrong on, but don't put false labels on them. Then everybody just says, you're totally off. You got to get it right. And I would suggest if you're going to critique these movements, then don't critique them on things that you just have. It's a secondary biblical issue. Are tongues for today or not? And you're going to critique whether or not you can't take those as the main issues because people are just not going to agree with you because you have no biblical argument to say there's no tongues for today. So stick with the things that should be criticized. And we'll get to some of those that I see. And there's probably many more, but I'm just going to mention a few. But I find that the discernment ministries that get it, they get it so, it's so grievous to see them miss it so dramatically on these issues because there's so much that does need to be properly critiqued, but they miss it by a mile. And so the people that need it the most, they can't hear it and they won't hear it. Number three, there are many. In. That's not true. Do you know there's movements in the UK, entire church movements that are reformed charismatics in the US as well? Reformed charismatics? Uh, people such as John Piper and other movements, their soteriology is reformed, yet they're charismatic. So it's not the problem with the charismatic church is not that they're Armenian. And besides, some of the greatest Christians of all church history were 
what, we, what many Calvinists would say are, we're Arminian. What about John Wesley? What about his followers? What about that whole movement? What about the Salvation Army movement? What about John Sung, the Chinese evangelist? What about the early church? Not a single Calvinist among them. None of them. Polycarp was not a Calvinist. Justin Martyr was not a Calvinist. None of the early church that gave their lives for the gospel were Calvinists. So you cannot say the problem with the charismatic church is that they're Arminian. It's just simply not true. Now, you may disagree with Arminianism. That's fine. And you may... You can critique certain things that maybe are indirectly a result of being Arminian, but the problem with them is not that they're Arminian. The problem is that they go too far in certain directions. And you, so you can't say, well, it's just because they're Arminian. Well, you can just turn around and say the problem with the Calvinists is that they're Calvinists. That's not true. There's been many gloriously godly Calvinists, the Puritans, uh, George Whitfield, uh, Charles Spurgeon, and many others throughout history that were Calvinist to the core, and you were very good, godly, Bible-believing, anoint, spirit-anointed preachers. So the problem is not that they're Calvinist, or that the problem is not that they're Arminian, and the, because most, for the most part, charismatic Pentecostal churches came out of the uh, Arminian churches. So, so the, those are the ones that predominate. Fourth. The problem with the charismatic churches is not the emphasis on the Holy Spirit. This is necessary. This is biblical and this is historical. If you go back again and read the accounts of revival, read Jonathan Goforth, the missionary to China, his revival accounts, his entire emphasis is on the Holy Spirit because he saw, he found after ministering in China so long with no power, the only way they were going to move forward was with the power of the Holy Spirit coming in a greater measure, which they experienced and they saw revival. Marie Monson was a Lutheran missionary from Norway to China. Same thing, power of God, Holy Spirit. Why? Because they had no power and that was the only way they could get this train moving. And so they looked to God, the Holy Spirit. They sought for this impartation of power, received it, and they saw the results. That's not the problem with the charismatic church. All of the church around the world should be desperately crying out day and night for the power of the Holy Spirit to come in greater measures and greater dimensions. And if you're not, it's because you've got more of the spirit of a Pharisee than of an apostle, because the apostle was praying for the Holy Spirit. He was praying for the spirit of wisdom and revelation for the Ephesians. In the Gospel of Luke, Luke is telling them to ask, seek, and knock. For what? For the greatest gift, which is the Holy Spirit. Well, I already have the Holy Spirit. Apparently not enough, because Luke tells the believers reading the Gospel of Luke to keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking for the Holy Spirit, to receive the Holy Spirit in greater power, in greater dimensions, and greater measure. So that's not what's wrong with the charismatic church. The emphasis on the Holy Spirit per se is not what's wrong with the charismatic churches. So let's look now at what is wrong or some of the things that are wrong with the charismatic Pentecostal churches. In my opinion, and from my observation, number one, they very seldom deal thoroughly and biblically with the issue of sin. Very seldom deal thoroughly and biblically and deeply with the issue of sin. It's as if we talk about the Holy Spirit in boldness, but have no boldness when it comes to the very most important issue that exists in the church of today. The issue of hindering sin in the churches, the, the issue of hindering sin in the pastors, the issue of hindering sin in the pulpit, and the issue of hindering sins in the pews. If you want to talk about the Holy Spirit, talk about Him all day long, it's all a bunch of rubbish, unless you are filled with power to declare the sins of God's people to them, as the prophet said. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit that I might declare unto my people their transgression and their sin. And the Holy Spirit also comes today to bring conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment. But somehow, sadly, in many, I won't say all, there's exceptions, but by and large, in my experience, charismatic Pentecostal churches touch very lightly on this issue. They very seldom go deep. They very seldom bring a strong word about sin. There's exceptions. There's a few exceptions. David Wilkerson, who's passed away, of course, over 10 years ago now, would have been an exception to that rule. There's a few people like that throughout the years, but generally speaking, charismatic Pentecostal churches almost have nothing to say about sin, unless it's just dealing with some area of growth in your character or something like that. But that's not enough. It's not enough to just say a word. I mean, dealing biblically with the issue of sin, laboring over the point of sin, bringing people through the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to a conviction of their undoneness before God. Like Isaiah entering the temple in Isaiah chapter 6 and realizing, I am undone, I'm undone, I'm a man of unclean lips. Woe is me, woe is me, woe is me. And then God brought the redemption. Nowadays, we've got people getting converted. Well, supposedly converted without ever having gone through that conviction. That's why we have a bunch of Christians that 
They don't get up in the morning to pray. They don't show up to church on time. They, they have no heart to seek God for reading the Bible and prayer and doing the deeper things. They, they just, they, if they're lucky. You're lucky if you can get them to show up to church, maybe do a little bit of ministry here and there, but their whole focus is on the world. Why? Well, because they're still in the world. Most of them are not really regenerate. And that's the other issue of the, well, I'm going to, I'll get to that next. But so the first one is don't deal with sin. The second one is don't speak about repentance with clear terms. Listen, the New Testament message is Jesus is the Christ. Therefore, believe? No. Therefore, repent. Yes, believe, but repent. You cannot believe without repenting. If you're in rebellion to God, which is what it means to be in sin, then how can you believe in him? You will not trust in the one that you're rebelling against. You must repent. You must remove this attitude and this lifestyle and this value system that works in direct, direct enmity with God. Repent and believe the good news. That's the gospel message. Nowadays, we've got a bunch of people that are heralding a message without any commandment with it. That's not the true gospel. And it will produce every sort of false convert. You will not get genuinely converted. You will not be a true Christian unless you've repented. What does it mean to repent? Surrender your life to God. Give your life to God. Give your future to God. Give your your mind to God, your heart to God, your body to God, to keep yourself clean, to keep your mind pure, to keep your life uh, holy in God's eyes. That's what it means to repent. If you don't do that, if you haven't done that, you're not, not a Christian. And so that's what I see one of the major issues with the charismatic church. The word repent has almost become a bad word. It's almost like, oh, you're just, le they want to call that legalism. They want to call that Old Testament. Now, you don't even know your Bible, man. If you want to call that legalism, you want to call that Old Testament, then Paul was Old Testament, Peter was Old Testament, and the whole New Testament is full of legalism. No, what we have is people that have never read the Bible for themselves, and they've heard a few hyper-grace heretics out there preaching a false gospel of grace. There is a true gospel of grace, but there's also a false gospel of grace. Jude, the apostle, spoke about that there will be these deceivers in the last days that teach people to follow their own lusts. And to, they will teach grace as a license for immorality or a license for lasciviousness or a license for lewdness. Those men have come on the scene and they've been there all along, but they are very prevalent today. But what's worse is how much of the charismatic church has absorbed that sort of DNA of hyper grace, even if they're te technically, they're, maybe they're not hyper grace, but they act as if they are. They're so afraid to deal with these issues thoroughly. Man, you're never going to see a move of God. You're never going to have true revival until that whole thing is torn down because God is holy and he's not going to be entertained in a house of clowns and goats. God wants to come into a holy temple where sin is dealt with thoroughly, where repentance is proclaimed loudly. And this is a third one, true conversion is dealt with thoroughly. Here we have Again, it all connects, not dealing with sin, not calling people to repentance. And this leads directly into the third point that, that I find wrong with the charismatic church in general is they don't deal with true conversion thoroughly or properly. Becoming a Christian has become something so cheap and easy. It's just a matter of raising a hand, saying a prayer, going to the altar, and it's all done. Wait a minute. What about this conviction of sin? What about this turning around of your life 180 degrees? What about this genuine transformation of God, the Holy Spirit, when he comes into our lives. So you talk about the Holy Spirit, you talk about gifts, right? Fine and well. But if you don't deal with conversion, then you've got a bunch of Balaam false prophets that are prophesying. They may be speaking in tongues, but the tongues of what? How can they be speaking in tongues from the Holy Spirit if they've not been born again of the Spirit? And this was one of the things that so shocked me when I came to Indonesia in the beginning and seeing in some of the charismatic churches, you have these guys, man, they're up there, they're raising their hands, they're praying, they're speaking in tongues, they're worshiping God. And then you talk to them afterwards and you find out these guys don't know the first thing about God. They're just in a performance. They're just in a mode. The churches seem to be very like dramatic and very, but it's just a performance. It's not reality. You sit down and talk to them. And I don't say this in a judgmental way. It's just a fact. I remember talking to a guy that would talk about going to, you know, drink and party on, you know, Saturday night. And then the next morning, reading his devotional and then going to church, it's like they don't see any conflict with it. Why? Because they're not holy. Why? Because they don't have the Holy Spirit. They're not born again. And this sort of thing is all over the world. This sort of thing is just rampant in charismatic Pentecostal churches, unconverted Christians. And until this issue is dealt with thoroughly, there's no hope for the charismatic church. There's no revival for a bunch of unconverted goats that are pretending to be the sheep of God.
And if you are truly a sheep of God, then you're not afraid of hearing messages about sin, and you're not afraid of the call to repentance. In fact, you welcome it because there's something in you that longs for holiness, and you know without holiness, no one will see the Lord, and you know that without repentance, you won't be holy. So a true born-again Christian loves to hear about sin, even though sometimes it's hard for our flesh, but it's like something within us is like, oh yeah, that's good, that's right. Even a strong rebuke is loved by a righteous man. And so how can it be that these charismatic churches can't hear a strong rebuke, can't hear a word about repentance, can't hear about the, the, the damnation of sin and the wrath of God against sin? They can't hear it. Most of them cannot hear it. How do I know? Because I've been around them, I've preached to them, and I know the response when I've preached those messages. Some of them have publicly got on the platform after I preached such a message and refuted it. Others didn't say anything, but clearly by their treatment of me and the situation afterwards, they completely rejected the message. They didn't want to talk after that. I've had this experience all over the world where I've gone preaching. I know what I'm talking about. Charismatic churches, by and large, cannot tolerate a strong word about sin and a call to repentance and God have mercy. I, I sometimes wonder, are these people really Christians at all? If you can't hear the most basic biblical Uh, gospel truths. What sort of Christian could you be? I don't know. I don't know. But this is what's truly wrong with the charismatic churches. I guess this goes into another issue we could deal with. There's no church discipline. In other words, you've got a guy up there on the worship team. This happened. Hillsong's New York. Homosexuals on the worship team. They knew about it. Nobody did anything about it. No church discipline. No church discipline. Charismatic Pentecostal churches, by and large, they have no standards, or they all they only implement them um, kind of arbitrarily. So, so for example, if you're in ministry, then we're going to hold you to a higher standard. That's not the New Testament teaching. The New Testament does not say if you're in ministry only will we discipline you if you're living in sin. Anybody who considers themselves a born-again Christian who has been baptized in water as a member of the church needs to be dealt with. If they're living a double life, they're living in open sin, then they need to be dealt with. If they, they need to be confronted. If, if they won't repent of it, then you bring them, you bring two or three others with you. If they still won't uh, respond, you bring them before the church and then you excommunicate them. Almost no churches today do that. Almost none of the charismatic Pentecostal churches deal with church discipline. Or again, only in a very minimal way. They deal only with leaders in that way. That's not the New Testament teaching. The New Testament teaching is anybody who is a member of the body of Christ is subject to this discipline, not just the select leaders involved. No church discipline. And I guess we could say it like this. Ultimately, what we find in the charismatic Pentecostal churches and I believe the the strongest critique that can be brought against them is a departure from the truth of God's word. You say, but don't the Pentecostal conservative churches, don't they hold that the word of God, the Bible is the word of God, et cetera, et cetera. That's true. So in certain senses, they're against like certain sins, like homosexuality. They're, They're against certain things like that. So there's a conservative sense like that. I don't deny that. In fact, oftentimes they're stronger in those areas than a lot of other evangelical traditions. However, What I mean by this departure from the truth of God's word in these charismatic churches is a departure from the hard truths of God's word. So they're happy that you talk about the Holy Spirit and gifts and miracles and all that sort of thing, but they're not happy when you talk about the judgment of God, the wrath of God. And um, why don't we talk, we love gifts, right? We love Corinthians. Corinthian church was full of gifts, spoken tongues, prophesying. Why don't we talk about what happened in the Corinthian church when they took communion? Some were weak, some were sick, and some died. Why? Because God judged them. Judgment begins first in the house of God. That's what Peter taught. Paul teaches it as well. How come the charismatic churches today don't want to talk about it? Yeah, because there's been a departure from the hard truths of God's word. This is scary, and this opens the door to every sort of delusion. This is why I believe, this is one of the reasons why oftentimes the charismatic churches are the ones that bring in so many heretical doctrines like hyper grace, uh, like just the prosperity gospel, etc. It seems to come through those doors because... um, I think that they've already had a certain departure from the certain truths of God's word, in particular, the hard truths of God's word. Now, if you say, I'm a charismatic, I'm a Pentecostal, and I... And I don't, I have not departed from the hard truths of God's word, or I I don't agree with, I agree with preaching against sin. I agree with the call to repentance. Well, then praise God, leave a comment and uh, let yourself be known. But I'm just stating what I found, particularly with leaders in these churches, that they don't want to deal with these issues. They're afraid of these issues and it trickles on down to the members. And uh, it's a tragedy. It's a scandal and it must be dealt with or these churches will eventually fully apostatize. Make no mistake about it. If a church makes a departure from the hard truths of God's word, they are already on the road to a full and final apostasy from all of God's word. So God have mercy on the charismatic churches of today. 
to come to repentance, to come to the issue of true conversion, to come back fully back to all of God's word. Not just teaching about gifts and miracles and prophecy, but even to more essential truths about sin, conviction of sin, repentance, true conversion, church discipline, embracing all of God's word for all of God's church. May God help us. I hope this has been helpful to you. Have a blessed day.